So all right, howdy out there. This is Beck Barnes and Jim Stebman of Cotton Grower fame coming at you with the internationally acclaimed Cotton Companion podcast here in this, the second week of August. Uh, whether you're joining us from the high plains of Texas or the or Plains, Alabama, we welcome you. I'm not 100% sure I haven't used that one before in one of our 53 now episodes. If I have, forgive me. Um, I am joined, as always, by my partner in crime, Cotton Growers Senior mm-hmm. Editor, Mr. Jim Stebman. Howdy, Jim. Hello, Beck. And I'm sure what you what you inadvertently tried to do there was create a poll to see who's listened all this yeah. all this time. Yeah, and yeah. I'm sure we if somebody if you've used it before, somebody will probably let us know. Yeah. Oh, I'd hear about it. I'd hear about it. I guarantee you. So uh, mm-hmm. we we are back in studio today um, on a kind of rainy, dreary day here in Memphis. That's got this uh, temperature dialed back. I know y'all would rather it be warmer out there here in the Mid-South, but we are back in the studio, and I know that some of y'all are casting your eyes a little bit down the road at this point. Y'all are thinking about getting to lay-by, starting harvest press, harvest prep, rather, uh, getting to harvest, getting to see some football, maybe getting in the deer stand. So we are here for all of that, uh, but like you, we know that there are some more pressing matters going on out there in the field before we can get to that good stuff. So uh, we are actually at this moment working on our August-September issue, which is effectively a September issue. It'll hit y'all's mailboxes second week of that month. Uh, But we're writing about PGRs. We're writing about maybe some off-season cover crop options. We're writing about harvest equipment safety, things that y'all are going to be dealing with in the coming months. Um, So we're right there with you, I guess is what I'm trying to say with that. But uh, it's been a busy week. Uh, in terms of cotton news here, we are, uh, we're we're going to be getting into that good stuff momentarily. But the first thing we want to do is bring you a quick word from our gracious sponsor, Phytogen. Phytogen is pleased to sponsor the Cotton Companion, bringing you the latest news to help you thrive all season long. All right, so that is a timely... Uh, Phytogen ad because at this moment we want to bring y'all a brief custom content segment featuring our own custom content editor Robin Sickberg and she recently spoke with Dr. Ken Leger that he is Phytogen's cotton development specialist for West Texas and Oklahoma so we're going to bring you that custom interview right now. Hello, I'm Robin Sipper, custom content editor for Meister Media Worldwide, which is publisher of Cotton Grower Magazine. And I'm here with Dr. Ken Leger, who's Phytogen Cotton Development Specialist in West Texas and Oklahoma. Welcome to the program, Ken. Thank you. And I know this is the time of year uh, cotton growers are looking at their fields and making plans for next season. And in particular, root knot nematode might be something that they're looking for uh, so they can plan variety selection next year. So what should they be looking for? in their fields. Certainly this time of year is a great year. If you suspect you have a root knot nematode issue, this is a time of year to evaluate that. You know, if you're seeing areas in your fields, if you're seeing hot spots where you're seeing stunted plants that have nutrient deficiency, uh, as well as yellowing leaves, and then you examine those plants uh, by pulling the roots up and you're seeing galls uh, across that root system, you could very well have root knot nematode in, in your soil. So if you suspect you have it, how do you go ahead about confirming the actual presence of it? Well, the best way is to uh, soil sample, and certainly you can sample this time of year, uh, particularly by pulling samples in affected and non-affected areas and sending those in according to your local extension guidelines. Uh, But to really determine the highest population in that field, uh, it's better to wait till fall, uh, say right before uh, defoliation timing, uh, particularly when that soil has a little bit of moisture in there to determine what your overall root knot nematode levels are. Okay, and so you get the bad news back from, from the soil testing and sampling, and you do have root knot nematode in your field. What do you do then? What are the next steps? Well, certainly you'll want to uh, plan to grow a root knot nematode resistant variety. Uh, we have some phytogen breeding traits. One of those is root knot nematode protection. Uh, it protects the roots all season long, so it not only reduces the damage uh, by up to 90% uh, that year, but it also reduces the nematode populations on subsequent seasons. Uh, so it, it is doubly important. We do have some, uh, some root knot resistant varieties. 
uh, for across the belt, namely Phytogen 350 W3FE, Phytogen 480 W3FE, and Phytogen 580 W3FE. You know, another aspect of our Phytogen breeding traits is there are no safety and handling issues uh, like you may get with other approaches to battling root knot nematodes. Certainly for more information, you can contact your local Phytogen Territory Manager or Cotton Development Specialist like myself, or you can simply go to phytogen.com for a lot more information. Well, thank you. That's uh, excellent information. I'm glad there's some really good solutions out there. Um, Thank you so much, Ken, for being on the program. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So a big thank you to Robin and to Ken Leger for that. I'm I, I'm like Pavlov's dog. I, I only ever see Ken uh, out in a big showy white field of phytogen cotton out there near Lubbock because every uh, harvest season, September, October, I head out to Lubbock for the field days from all of the seed companies and phytogen is certainly uh, a stop on our tour out there. And Ken is always in the middle of that stuff with a big phytogen flag in a big old pretty field. And so I can't hear his name without picturing <laughs> there in that spot. So um, at any rate, I uh, hope he's doing well out there if he's listening. At any mm-hmm. rate, uh, let's get the ball rolling here uh, in this our 53rd episode of the Cotton Companion. And we got a good one for you today. Uh, Jim, as always, <clears throat> is going to lead us in our news segment where we're going to be talking about, among other things, crop progress, some insect pressures ramping up, and a longtime cotton advocate who is retiring from Capitol Hill. And uh, after that, we'll bring you the second part of a conversation, or no, it was not a conversation, excuse me, we'll bring you the second part of a speech from Mr. Frederick Barrier, who is a vice president at Staple Cotton. Uh, Jim, listen to uh, Mr. Barrier give this speech at the Southern Cotton Jenners Association annual meeting uh, a couple of weeks back now. So anyhow, he's going to be talking about global cotton consumption and some of our America's competitors uh, around the globe and a lot of juicy stuff that affects the price of cotton that, that uh, y'all won't want to miss. So we got a great episode today. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over here to my man, Jim, who is going to lead us a in a more focused discussion of the news items of the day. So Jim, go for it. Thank you, Beck. Um, as, as Beck mentioned, we're going to start with a look at the current crop progress uh, information from USDA. Uh, I think it was safe to say that the, the last report that we saw earlier, uh, I think this one will be dated August 5th, uh, shows that the U.S. cotton crop is essentially has caught up to its five-year averages uh, for squaring and for bowl set. That's five-year averages for that date. But as it's done that, it is also continuing to walk a very fine line in terms of crop condition from week to week. Uh, The most latest crop report shows some pretty small percentage shifts in crop condition. With 54% of the crop rated good to excellent, that was 61% a week the previous week. 33% now rated fair, and that's up from 28%. And 13% now rated poor, very poor. That's a slide back from only 11%. So, uh, again, as you can see, based on growing conditions, based on weather, based on other environmental impact, uh, things are just kind of shifting around from week to week at this point. But the numbers are staying at least relatively consistent. Uh, Squaring percentages are now above or right at the five-year average for this date. Uh, was squaring reported in about 95% of the U.S. crop. Uh, Ten states on or above average, and others really are just a few percentage points behind. And uh, I won't be surprised if this uh, if this little measurement for squaring drops out of the report here uh, within the next week uh, as we start looking to more in terms of open bowls and, uh, and possibly even some initial harvest as, uh, as South Texas gets rolling. Uh, bowl set now reported in 59% of the U.S. crop. That's up 14% in the past week, with seven states running at or slightly above their five-year average. So, in, in again, in all essence, this crop has caught up, even though it may be in different stages of growth. Uh, and, and we know that's that's impacting a lot of growers in terms of their, uh, their current field operations. Yeah, again, <clears throat> I, I've... 
I've kind of been amazed to watch it catch up after the very terrible start we got off to around here. I know in the southeast they were dealing with the drought out there, and and uh, anyhow, it's 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 been encouraged. I know we took a minor kind of step back out of the good to uh, the the uh, back to fair cotton in this report, this crop progress report. Mm-hmm. But uh, to your point, Jim, we are catching up mm-hmm. from a bad start. We stumbled out of the gate, so encouraging to hear. Yeah, when you still look at market issues and market reports, uh, you know, the potential for this year's crop uh, in terms of production is still re- rated pretty high, uh, which is, is a good thing on one hand and maybe a not so good thing on the other. But we'll uh, we'll see how the year ends out on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, with all of this uh, cotton moving into uh, later stages of production, obviously, uh the, the crop's pretty much all over the board in terms of maturity, but insect pressure is starting to, uh, to grow, and it's really kind of a mixed bag from region to region based on some reports that we've been getting. In the southeast, uh, the biggest pests to, to date have been stink bugs, spider mites, and white fly issues, plus there's plant bugs and bollworms obviously in the mix, but to a much lesser, surprisingly lesser extent uh, than they've had in past years. In the mid-south, starting to battle the same consistent uh, consistent pest. Plant bug numbers are increasing, and that's primarily in that later planted cotton that is not moving along as, uh, not maturing as quickly as the others. Uh, we've got some bollworm moth flights present, and those are expected to increase here over the next week. Uh, so far, reports uh, have shown that the three gene insect traits are holding up pretty well against the worm pressure we're seeing out there. But uh, state entomologists and consultants are keeping a close eye on varieties with the two gene insect traits. Uh, as based on some of their reports, they haven't really had to pull the trigger on large scale problems yet, but obviously they're ready to do so if thresholds uh, are met or exceeded. And down in the southwest, uh, growers are treating plant bugs, stink bugs, and spider mites where needed, but particularly when you get into South Texas, uh, cotton is nearing harvest. Uh, there's low insect pressure reported in the western parts of the states, so growers really are just working to keep the crop and their uh, and their weed pressure under control at this point. Next item, while we're talking about Texas, uh, some interesting news. Good, good for him. Not so. Mm, we'll see how it works out for the cotton industry. But U.S. Representative Mike Conaway, who was one of the strongest voices for agriculture in the House of Representatives. Uh, has announced that he is not going to seek re-election in 2020. And now Conaway represents Texas's 11th congressional district. He has served eight, year, eight terms in Congress beginning back in 2005, and he obviously plans to finish his current term. Now, over the past year or so, if you've been listening to the Cotton Companion, we have mentioned Congressman Conaway numerous times, especially in relation to the 2018 Farm Bill. He chaired the House Agriculture Committee from 2015 through 2018 and was really one of the key driving forces behind development and passage of that 2018 farm legislation. Uh, He was a real champion for the U.S. cotton industry and was instrumental in helping getting cotton back to the farm bill as a protected, protected commodity. And he's currently serving still on the committee as the committee's ranking member. Now, Beck, I know you and I have had the opportunity and privilege of meeting and working with Representative Conaway over the past few years, crossing paths with him in industry events like National Cotton Council annual meeting, uh, some several regional meetings and and gatherings in West Texas. I always found him to be a straight shooter when it came to agriculture and certainly when it came to the cotton industry. Yeah, no doubt about it. He was, he got stuff done, you know, is what I think of it. He wasn't uh, somebody... He wasn't a member of Congress who was always, um, I'm trying to tread lightly here, but he, he didn't play politics. He, he just kind of kept his nose down and, and looked out for his constituency is what I felt like. And I remember uh, you, you mentioned 2018, that farm bill and getting cotton back under Title I. I feel like he was very, or he was a big champion prior to that of trying to get cotton oil seed. Yes, he was. Uh, as a food. I forget how that played out trying to get it designated as a as a food oil seed or or anyhow um he was just tireless what c- cotton's 
what was good for cotton, uh, he knew it and he, he worked towards it and worked on our behalf. So, uh, you know, I, I wish him a happy retirement. I'm sure the, the folks out in Texas do as well. I wish he'd stick around. And again, I'm sure they do as well, but, <laughs> but um, you know, good, good for him. He's been a good one. Yep, absolutely. It's yeah, he's, his retirement's going to be a big loss, not just for cotton, but, but I think for U.S. agriculture as a whole. So uh, our best to, uh, to you, Congressman Conaway, and to your family. And then finally, one last item that, that I think I'm, is, Beck's not exactly sure what to make of this item because he, no. hasn't, he doesn't know what it's about. Uh, yeah, I didn't ask because I knew he I was, does, he it was kept ask. ambiguous for a reason. Yeah, yeah because, because every now and then I will find a little tidbit that's, that's a little offbeat, <laughs> but still pertains to cotton. Yeah. So over the past week, News crossed my desk from the American Chemical Society, of all people, of all groups. Researchers have successfully modified cotton fabric to emit a lemony citronella aroma upon contact with sweat, which essentially allows your clothing to cover up embarrassing smells with a burst of fragrance, as they put it. Okay. Now, I'm not smart enough to understand or decipher all the details on how the researchers were able to achieve this olfactory breakthrough. <laughs> but it certainly sounds promising. And and I really wonder if it could also serve or will also serve as sort of a wearable mosquito repellent. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be all ears for that one yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. I could, I could see a big market for that. <laughs> yeah. So, but if you're interested in this, if this sounds interesting to you and you're brave enough to want more details on it, because trust me, there were a lot of details that I, you know, with words I can't even pronounce. Uh, the researchers have published their odor fighting strategies in the publication ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. And no, we do not have a link to that off of uh, cottongrower.com, but you can find it online via Google or your favorite search engine. And with that, Beck, back to you. <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. I'm trying to think of uh, <laughs> how I would even need that. Back in uh, my younger days when I was, when I occasionally went to the gym, I, I might've been interested in covering my, my uh, s- smell up, but um, I hadn't darkened the door of a gym in quite a while. So I got no use for that stuff, but I appreciate you bringing <laughs> it to my attention. So uh, I was looking for new uses for cotton. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm glad. I'm. It's. uh, It was interesting. Glad you went with it. Um, (laughs) So all right, we we do want to bring you now uh, that speech from Mr. Frederick Barrier of Staple Cotton, and uh, he gave this presentation to the crowd up at the Southern Cotton Jenners Association summer meeting or annual meeting. It was in the summer up there. Uh, y'all were in Missouri, right, Jim? We were in Branson, Missouri. Branson, Missouri. And uh, I believe I had to ask you that uh, before we <clears throat> presented this speech in the last episode. The reason he's asking is because we're our travel schedule is getting ready to really ramp up. So yeah, yeah. Okay. we may not know where we are from day to yeah, day. Yeah, at, at any point. given moment, yeah. yes. So, but anyhow, uh, I know it was a good it was a good speech. We listed the first part of it in the last episode. Can you give me kind of briefly a summary of what Mr. Barrier was talking about in this in, section of in the this segment, and, and really it's kind of timely when you sit back and, and look at some of the things that have happened uh, between the U.S. and China in terms of tariffs here within the last week, week and a half. But in these comments, he discusses the U.S.-China trade dispute and outlines some of the reasons why China really, really needs U.S. cotton. And, and again, in a more general term and, and with a few specifics, why we all need this dispute to be over with. Okay, very cool. All right, well then, uh, we will bring you all this, this speech from Mr. Frederick Barrier right now. Tim, I wouldn't come all the way up here if I wasn't optimistic about something. Yeah, I've been a cotton farmer. I, 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 I feel this way. And, you know, I'm hanging on the tweets just like y'all are. There's sometimes I wish I could shut the tweets down, okay? But, uh, you know, Trump goes over and steps across the demarcation line in, 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 uh, in uh, Korea, and he's, he's tweeting positive things about the development of a trade deal. And uh, I'll tell you what, if we get a trade deal, agriculture is going to be a big part of it. You can be almost rest assured that cotton will play a huge part in this. We just need to get a deal. China needs to replace their strategic reserves. Those, those reserves are old, some of that cotton 11, 10, 11, 12 crop. 
It's time to rotate that cotton out and they work through the good cotton. It's time for them to come in. They continue to operate a production consumption deficit. Plus 13 million bales. I mean, how long can you do that? If not, if we miss a crop, we're going to be back in the shape we were several years ago when the cotton market went up to $1.50. Because, because it won't be enough time. U.S. is going to have an exportable surplus. If any year it was a year for us to export a lot of cotton to China or, or all around the world, this is it. And then last but not least, I mean, futures prices are well below our cost of production. How can that not be competitive and attractive to people using cotton around the world? Sooner or later, they're going to wake up and realize cotton prices are too cheap. Okay? They're going to wake up and realize they're too cheap. There's just only one market that's been able to set the floor for cotton over the years, and that's been China. When they come in and buy that reserve. Two years ago, they wanted to buy cotton for the reserve. The future market never got there. Now we've got a perfect, perfect opportunity. If we grow a high-grade U.S. crop, they can come in and gobble it up. So let's look at the Chinese reserve stocks. I think this is a pretty good chart. A lot of talk about the Chinese reserves. Few people really know what's going on there, but we look at Chinese stocks. You look at 2014, China has stocks approaching 67 million bales, of which 51 million bales were in those reserves. And over time, we can see those reserves started dwindling down. And today, uh, we ended 18 with 12.6. This year, we're forecasting that number to be as low as 8.3 million bales. It's time for them to rotate those stocks. This will be the perfect time to do it, a great opportunity for us. Their non-reserve stocks are about 21, 22 million bales. It's not a big factor, but if you look at those reserve stocks, I mean, it would make sense for them to come to market. And finally, this is a, a, just a, a good graph that I think puts it in context. If you go back from, this is a, the blue is the production, the green the imports, and the red is the consumption. But if you look back at 2014 to today, China will have had a deficit of over 35 million bales. That's a lot of darn cotton, okay? A lot of darn cotton they need. So, um, I don't know if y'all remember Monty Hall, but it's time to make a deal. And the only go behind a curtain is us not getting a trade deal with China. I can assure you that. We're well set up for a trade deal. Uh, we've got a good crop coming on. Uh, we've got great efficiencies that are in place. Our trade lanes are good. Our relationships are good. Financing in place, letters of credit open easily. Uh, China still prefers U.S. cotton, I think. You know, uh, probably not over Australia, but they prefer U.S. cotton. Uh, Australia's in the second year of a drought. Very tight market for high grades out there. Now, obviously, West Texas can grow much high grades to impact that, but right now, the high grade market is pretty tight. Not a lot of U.S. high grades available. U.S. high grades for next year are pretty well subscribed. So, a lot of high grades for next year. Um, so, I think the high grade basis will remain firm. We've got the potential for the large crop to make it happen. And, you know, our export surplus is growing. China's a lot too. Is Bob Barker would say the price is right. I mean, again, guys, th th this market is too cheap. And it's going to take somebody with the guts and the courage to come out and, and buy it and sign it as a one. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, agreement between the U.S. and China has the ability to set a floor for cotton. Uh, another thing to keep out, uh, keep an eye on, or especially the record net short position, it's over 37,000 contracts. Right now, they're running the market. But you need some you need some news to knock them out to reverse that trend. Right now we just don't have it. Uh, but they're they're record short. And finally, last but not least, the trade deal would just give us some stability we need right now. And the markets, that's what the market's lacking today. Um, you know, it's a, again, I'm an optimistic guy. It makes too much sense. Uh, politics has gotten involved, and, and, and unfortunately we're paying the price for that. We see cotton prices come under a tremendous pressure, but uh, all in all, I, I, I think it's in both parties' interest to get a trade deal done. I think the key for the Chinese are going to be how they're going to save face, how they're going to get a trade deal done and, and save face. And, um, and for us, uh, we just need, we need a home for our, our agricultural products. So, all right, we want to give a big thank you to Mr. Frederick Barrier and to Staple Cotton for always being so sharp and on top of all the developments uh, around U.S. cotton.
So that's going to just about do it for this installment of the Cotton Companion podcast. We want to thank Phytogen for sponsoring us, and we want to thank you, dear listener, for joining us. As always, uh, if you like what you're hearing, tell your buddies about us. Uh, They can find us in three easy ways. The first is going to cottongrower.com forward slash companion. The second is by subscribing to our channel on iTunes or wherever it is that you find your podcast these days. The third way, the best way, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, the Cotton Grower e-newsletter. Uh, you can do that by going to the going to www.cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe. Also, make sure you're following us on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter. And on Facebook, you can find us by searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. We hope you're enjoying our latest issue, which was the May issue. May, June. May, June issue at this point. <laughs> Our next one, the August-September issue, as I mentioned earlier, we're working on now. It'll be hitting your mailboxes that second week of September. This podcast is produced by Mr. Tyler Hatch. He works at the Mothership Meister Media Worldwide in beautiful Willoughby, Ohio. My name is Beck Barnes, and I'll be back with you in two weeks on the next episode of The Cotton Companion. For now, on behalf of my own Cotton Companion, Mr. Jim Stebman, we wish you and your farm all the best. Phytogen thanks you for listening to this edition of The Cotton Companion. To learn how you can thrive with Phytogen, go to phytogen.com.